presentation. All right. Thank you, Jill. Um, mm. And welcome, everyone. Thank you for spending part of your weekend uh, with me. Um, I know you're all really busy people, and I do appreciate that you're that invested um, in your profession, that you want to learn some more stuff, and um, I'm here to help you with all of that. So thank you so much for your time. Um, I said, like I said before, there's a lot to get through today. Um, so I will try and go quickly, but not too quickly. Um, so please um, put some feedback in the chat if you feel like I am going too fast, um, but I've looked through my slides. And there is a lot there. Um, some of it is very physics-y, and I know a lot of you are uh, therapists and may kind of not really be interested in the physics stuff, but I promise you the stuff that I'm telling you is stuff that you need to know as therapists. So I, I have kept it very relevant um, for you guys. So hopefully uh, you can see my screen. Uh, because I cannot see you anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, we can see it, Claire. Perfect. Excellent. Um, so I'll get started. So um, yes, this is session three of a long list of sessions um, looking at IMRT specifically for uh, radiation therapists, um, which is great. So uh, we'll get cracking on today's session. I can click. Perfect. Um, so just a quick outline of the stuff that we will cover today. Um, so I'm just going to cover uh, just quickly some general principles in dosimetry because that kind of stuff, even though it's really probably pre-IMRT, um, it's still really important for you guys as therapists to understand, um, to make you safe and to make you good at your job and to make uh, your patients safe when you treat them. Um, and then we'll start to look into treatment planning um, in 3D specifically, and then start on the principles of inverse planning uh, for IMRT uh, uh, radiation therapy treatments. Uh, the first thing I really want to point out to put all of this into perspective is about radiation accidents. Um, and when we have radiation accidents and like big radiation accidents in radiation therapy, where lots of patients are impacted, um, they're generally caused by one of three things. So those three things are treatment planning errors, uh, their equipment malfunctions, and their equipment calibration errors. So as radiation therapists, uh, you guys have the power to directly input an impact on patient treatment safety and quality. So you can do this by having a, gr a good understanding of the different parameters that affect a treatment plan, um, both in terms of the plan quality and the plan calculations. Uh, and this is really important because you as radiation therapists need to be able to notice when a treatment plan is different from what you expect. Um, and if you do notice a treatment plan is different from what you expect, it's important that you have that you speak out. Um, you don't just beam on and go, I'm not sure this is right, but I'm just going to beam on and treat this patient. You ask the question, can we please check this? Um, it's really important. So you guys as therapists have that power um, to, to really stop uh, um, some major accidents that can happen in radiation therapy. So I just want to put that into perspective and uh, acknowledge the, the responsibility that you guys have as radiation therapists. Um, so we're going to start off with general principles in dosimetry, all that fun physics stuff that we love. Um, so we'll look at firstly... How do we calculate a monitor unit um, for a treatment plan? And then the things that affect uh, monitor unit calculations. So the first thing is really what is the aim of a treatment plan calculation? So really when we're doing a treatment plan calculation, what we're trying to do is get from an unknown situation where we have a radiation beam passing through a patient, really not understanding how much dose they get from that radiation beam, to a situation that we do know. Um, and that's the reference conditions of the LINAC. Um, so we know when we calibrate the LINAC and we, you know, we have a big tank of water or we have some phantoms there and we have chambers and all the fancy equipment, we know that we can accurately measure the amount of radiation coming out of the LINAC. Um, so when we've got a 10 by 10 field, a D max, 100 centimeters SSD, we get one gray. 
uh, a radiation dose delivered. So really what we're trying to do is go from what's happening in the patient to something that we do know um, and we know very well. So how do we work out how many monitor units we need to give uh, per treatment field for our patients? So there's two different types of uh, calculations and simple calculations that you can use in those situations. One is where you're using percentage depth dose um, and that's where you've got a fixed FSD or F SSD type of treatment. And then the other uh, equation that we use is for an isocentric treatment where we have a fixed SAD. So our isocenter is basically sitting in the middle of our tumor volume and um, the gantry is rotating about the patient. Um, so those two ca calculations look very similar. Um, the only things that are really different between those two is that one uses percentage depth dose and one uses tissue maximum ratios. Um, and the inverse square laws are also slightly different, but we'll work through all of those in the next few slides. Uh, so firstly, if we're doing a fixed SSD treatment, um, so we're just basically trying to set 100 centimetres usually to the, to the skin surface. Um, the first thing we want to do is correct from the depth of treatment in the patient. So in our little example here, we've got a cross section of our patient. We want to treat a patient at Y centimetres depth. That could be five, six, 10, three centimetres depth. And we need to correct that back to our known condition, which is D max. Um, so what we do in that case is we use our percentage depth dose. So we have the same field size in both cases, the same SSD and just different depths uh, in the patient. So that's what our percentage depth dose will do in that situation. Um, if we look at percentage depth doses, obviously we get different percentage depth doses for different um, photon energies. Um, so the higher the photon energy, the deeper um, the radiation beam penetrates the patient, the deeper that Dmax uh, is. Um, so beyond increasing beam energy, um, we also get increases in the depth dose inside the patient if we increase the field size. So if we have a 10 by 10 field or we have a 20 by 20 field, we actually get more radiation inside the patient for a larger field size. Um, and also if you increase the SSD. So if you increase SSD from 90 to 100, uh, the dose drop off inside the patient. Um, increases in that case also, probably not as much uh, as increasing the energy or the field size, but it certainly, um, it, it certainly increases as well. If we do an isocentric treatment uh, in, that, in those two equations, the thing that's different is called the tissue maximum ratio. Um, what the tissue maximum ratio does is it allows us to determine the dose at depth in a patient for a, a specific field size for an isocentric treatment. Uh, so in this case, we're looking at a depth Y inside the patient. And here we've got a depth D max uh, in our known scenario. And then what we're doing is we're just fixing it at 100 centimeters um, for both of those cases. So that's what the tissue maximum ratio is. So in both cases, our I guess our point of interest is 100 centimetres um, from the, the source, um, but at different depths uh, inside the patient. So that's what the tissue maximum ratio uh, does. Um, so the next thing that we have to look at is a collimator scatter factor. So the collimator scatter factor is in both of those two equations that I just showed briefly before. Uh, what the collimator scatter factor does is it accounts for any radiation that's scattered from the collimators or the treatment head of the LINAC or the MLCs. Um, and the amount of scatter that comes from these pieces of equipment differs as you change the field size that you use for treatment. Um, so by putting the collimator scatter factor in, what we're doing is we're correcting the field size in the treatment head um, to the 10 by 10 field that we use for our calibration of the, 
the, the treatment, you know, our known situation. Um, so as you increase the field size, the collimator scatter factor increases because the larger the field size, the more scatter radiation uh, you're going to get. So um, the thing about the collimator scatter factor is it doesn't consider the patient or the tissue or anything the radiation is passing through. It's really just the field size. So it only considers the, um, the settings inside the treatment head. So the collimator settings, basically. Uh, the next factor that's in those equations is called the phantom scatter factor. Um, and so this uh, factor accounts for radiation scatter that's coming from within the patient um, for different field sizes. So we've got two kind of scatter factors. There's the collimator scatter factor, which corrects for scatter coming from the machine and the equipment. And then the phantom scatter factor corrects for the scatter that's coming from within the patient um, themselves. So, um, so we, we like kind of separate the two things out. Um, so it's quite easy to measure the collimator scatter factor because you can just put an iron chamber in air um, because there's nothing around it. So you're just measuring the scatter from the collimators. Um, you can't actually physically measure just the phantom scatter factor. Um, that's because when you put a chamber in a phantom, you've got scatter coming from the collimators and the MLCs at the same time. So you can't actually remove the, the collimator scatter factor or the collimator scatter out of the radiation beam. Um, so if we want to measure these factors, um, to be able to put them in our planning system or in our dose calculations, um, the thing that we measure is called the total scatter, scatter factor. So it, it incorporates the collimator and the phantom scatter factor. So it's a multiplication of both. So by applying the total scatter factor, what we can do is we can correct for radiation scatter from the collimator and the treatment head and the MLCs. Um, and for the scatter coming from within the patient. So what this factor does is correct the treatment field size to the reference field size. Um, and what we find is that the scatter factor increases as you increase the field size. So as, as the field gets larger, you've got more scattered radiation uh, coming into your point of interest inside your patient. So the scatter factor therefore increases uh, with field size. Um, sometimes you might notice if you're doing a hand calc or if you're using a simple dose calculation model um, that you'll have a different uh, factor for collimator scatter uh, or a different field size, sorry, for collimator scatter and for phantom scatter. Um, and sometimes you need to do this if the field that's coming out of your collimator or your MLCs is not passing all the way through the patient. So a really great example of this is in the breast patient. So you can see here, we've got our collimator settings and we've got you know, the, the beam partially blocked here. So we've, we've just got this sort of slightly conformal beam passing through um, the breast here. But you can see that the, the radiation beam, part of the radiation beam is not passing through any part of the patient. It's just passing in air when we've got overshoot uh, on the breast. So in a case like this, you would have your collimator scatter factor coming from the collimator settings uh, here, but your phantom scatter factor would come from the field size that's passing through the patient. So it would be a smaller, uh, I guess, uh, equivalent field size. Um, so in that instance, you actually have two different field sizes uh, in the one equation. So that's something that's, that's important to note because that can actually make quite a big bit of difference um, in your monitor unit calculation, up to several percent uh, in some cases. <coughs> With me. Um, so the next thing that we want to look at is the off-axis ratio. Um, so the OAR, which is not to be confused with organs at risk, which we will talk a lot about um, during this lecture and, and the following lectures as well. Um, so the off-axis ratio 
corrects for when your point of interest in your patient isn't on the central axis of the beam, uh, you need to, I guess, correct for that position back to the central axis because that's where our reference point is in our known situation. Um, so that's when you apply your off axis ratio. So if your position in your patient over here on the left, if that was sitting on the central axis, your off axis ratio would be one because it's sitting on the central axis. Uh, the further you move away from the central okay. axis, the, the different uh, off axis ratio values that you would see. Um, I think this might be the last one. Um, so the inverse square law, um, I'm sure you've all heard the inverse square law and how radiation reduces in intensity as you move away with the inverse square law. Um, so we apply this into our equation. So this corrects for different SSDs or different SADs between the patient and the reference condition. So in this case, um, you know, if we've got an SSD of X, let's call it X centimeters, um, back to 100 centimeters uh, in our reference condition. Um, so that would be for a fixed SSD treatment. For an isocentric treatment, really all we're doing is correcting from 100 centimeters at our reference point back to 100 plus D max uh, for our, um, or 100, 100 centimeters for our patient back to 100 centimeters plus D max for our reference condition. So the inverse square law for an isocentric treatment is usually a fixed value um, based on the energy uh, of the radiation. So inverse square laws are independent of field size, um, but they are dependent on energy because you've got that D max value. And obviously D max depends on um, the energy of radiation that you use for the beam. Okay, so two equations. Don't expect you to remember the equations, but just wanted to kind of give you an introduction about if things change, how does this impact on our monitor units? Um, so let's think about for the same dose. Okay, we want to get the same dose in our patient at depths beyond D max. So if we increase the energy, um, by increasing the energy, there's less drop off in the radiation beam as it passes through the patient. So we need less monitor units. So if you change your beam energy from a six, MV to a 10 MV, you need less monitor units give, to give the same dose at depth in a patient because there's more radiation in the, in the 10 MV as it passes through the patient. If we increase the field size, and if you remember, if we increase the field size, what we're doing is increasing the scatter, um, both from the collimators and from within the patient. So we're increasing the scatter dose. Um, at points beyond Dmax. And so again, we need less monitor units to deliver the same amount of dose. So if we have a five by five field size and a 20 by 20 field size, all else being equal, we need less monitor units for the 20 by 20 field size than we do for the five by five. If we increase the SSD, um, so remember your inverse square law, so radiation intensity drops off, as distance is increased, so more monitor units will be needed. So if we increase our SSD from 100 to 110 um, to get the same dose in the patient at the same depth, we need to increase the number of monitor units. Um, and as you move away from the central axis, so our off-axis ratios, uh, in general, the dose drops off as you move away from the central axis. So um, you need more monitor units in those situations uh, to deliver the same dose. So really those four points um, are the things that you really need to remember. Okay, so increasing energy, less monitor units are needed for the same dose. If you increase the field size, we get more scatter. So we need less monitor units. If we increase the SSD, um, the radiation intensity falls away, so we need more monitor units. And if we move away from the central axis, so we move off axis, um, 
Again, the dose drops away a little bit, so we need more monitor units. Um, so those four points are really important, particularly if you're doing, still doing hand calcs and things like that for simple treatments, um, to know that if something changes, should our monitor units be higher or lower than they were before? So um, they're really four key points to remember. Um, and again, I want to bring this back to how this works in practice and give you an example. And this happened in the United Kingdom. So, you know, a country you expect is doing some pretty high tech, pretty high quality treatments. Um, so this was an incident that lasted eight years. So I'm from 1982 to 1990. Um, so during that time, patients were treated using a fixed SSD treatment. So all patients were treated around about 100 centimetres. Um, if they had patients with an SSD other than 100, the radiation therapists would use the inverse square law factor to correct the monitor units. So remember, if you increase the SSD, you need to increase the number of monitor units. Um, so during that time, 1982, they purchased a new treatment planning system. So what happened is the therapists continued to manually apply the inverse square law correction um, to all of the calculations. Um, however, they didn't realize that the treatment planning system already applied the inverse square law correction. Um, so what happened was the inverse square law factor was applied twice. Um, so what this meant was um, those patients that had an SSD other than 100 centimeters uh, were unusually um, more than 100 centimeters. Um, those patients were underdosed. Um, and depending on the distance away from their SSD technique, uh, those, that underdosage could be up to 30%. So this problem wasn't detected uh, in this department for eight years and affected over 1,000 patients. And because of this, nearly 500 patients, and so nearly half of those patients developed recurrences. Um, and they suspect that a lot of those were likely due to the underdose that radiation that they'd received. So this is why it's really important for you guys as therapists to know when something changes, what your monitor units should look like, um, particularly around hand calculations and those simple, those simple dose calculations that are done. So... The simple dose calculation formula that I showed you before, the two different formulas, um, they work really well for point doses with really simple geometry. So square fields, rectangular fields, really nothing unusual uh, going on in the patient um, for really simple geometry. So if we're starting to now think about more complex geometry or we're thinking about volumetric dose calculations and so not just dose to a single point, we start, need to use more complex formulas than the ones that we've looked at. So we call those complex formulas algorithms. So you've probably heard the word before. That's really what we're talking about. An algorithm is just like a really, really hard formula. Um, one that's really too hard to write down on a piece of paper. Um, so an algorithm will require a computer that has more processing power. Um, but the, the benefit of an algorithm is that it can compute doses more accurately, particularly in three dimensions. So you can get that nice volumetric uh, dose calculations. Um, the thing about these more complicated algorithms is they can account for different tissues. So they can account for air and bone and all things in between. Um, they can account for different contours on the patient's skin surface. Um, and also the different dose levels within, within a single plan. So this is really what our standard treatment planning systems these days um, can do with the algorithms. But even in a, in a treatment planning system, there are multiple algorithms also. So there's quite simple algorithms to more complicated algorithms. And so depending on um, what your physics team um, is doing, you may still be using quite a simple algorithm um, if they've, you know, invested some time and energy and, and, and got some understanding and, and commissioned one of the more complicated ones, then your dose calculations are a little bit more sophisticated as well. Um, so we're just going to do our first Zoom poll. So do I need to stop sharing for this? I think I do. Um, so 
Jill's going to run this one for me. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, yeah. You should see a, a poll, a little pop up on your screen now for you to be able to answer the question. Perfect. So I'll just read it out. So if we think about a point dose at a depth 10 centimeters inside a patient. Okay. So if we increase the beam energy of the radiation beam, um, let's consider same field size, it's the same patient, same depth in the patient. Um, in order to give the same dose, the same depth in that patient with a higher energy beam, do we need to increase the number of monotunits or decrease the number of monotunits? So if we go from 6 MV to 10 MV, would we expect to have more monotunits or less monotunits to give the same dose? All right, we'll give that one a couple, couple more seconds for everyone to get their answer in. Perfect. Hello, we haven't got to the poll on the screen. Oh, you haven't? We can't, yes. Um, it should have just popped up on your screen. There's, there's a number of people who have answered. So I'm guessing that they're seeing it. I'm not sure if it's- Mine. Mine It might be in a hasn't. separate window. Like if you've uh -huh. got a uh, full screen, it might not appear. So maybe if you exit full screen, you might be able to see the little pop-up window. Just as a thought. And Claire, just while we're waiting for the poll to, to run, um, Mishak had a really good point in the chat um, just about how every radiation therapist should have a planning orientation, which isn't the case in a lot of centers, um, just to help with the, the communication between treatment planners and the treatment delivery teams so that everyone's on the same page when it comes to these plan changes. I thought that was a great point. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, for example, that example I gave in the UK, um, you know, the therapist should have been communicated to, the planner should have been communicated to from the physics team who commissioned the planning system that, hey, the inverse square law is already applied. You don't need to do that. So right. uh, yeah. communication is absolutely essential um, in, in every department. I can't stress yeah. that enough. We should always, always be talking to each other. All right, it looks like our poll responses are slowing down. So we have about 30% of people saying A, increase, and about 70% of people saying B, decrease. So Claire, what is our answer? Okay, let me end that poll. Um, I'm going to go back and share my screen. Oh, hang on, let me just move that. Okay, here we go, drum roll. So it's decrease. So yay, 70% of you got it. Um, so yes, so if we increase the beam energy, the higher energy beam is more penetrating at depth because there are more photons available to deposit dose in the patient. So we need less monitor units uh, to give the dose, the same dose uh, to the patient. So um, bravo to those of you who got it. Uh, those of you that didn't, I hope this now makes a little bit more sense for you. Um, and if it doesn't, please uh, flick an email and we can we can work on this together. Um, I can explain a little bit more for you. It is a it's taken me a long time, many, many years to get my head around all of these concepts. So I don't expect you to get it uh, in a few minutes. So um, I'm always happy to work with you beyond beyond this um, presentation also. Um, so, but for the sake of time, uh, we will move on. Um, and so we're now going to look at, so really all those slides were talking about treatment planning in 2D. So we're talking about calculating uh, dose to a single point inside a patient. So now let's look at treatment planning in 3D, which I think is what, what we're all um, very familiar with. Okay. So 3D imaging and really you know, more complicated and advanced treatment planning systems, including algorithms, uh, have been game changers for radiotherapy. So now in these, you know, by having incorporated 3D imaging, we can see and we can outline the treatment target, um, as well as the organs at risk around it that we need to protect. Um, 
So in, in order to do this and in order to accurately calculate dose in the patient, uh, we need computed tomography or CT scans uh, for 3D imaging. Um, the reason we need CT images is because these are used in our 3D dose calculation. So we actually use the information from the CT scan um, to calculate, accurately calculate the dose in the different tissues. Um, so that's why we need to use computer tomography. Um, and obviously we have our treatment planning systems with the uh, you know, fancier algorithms uh, that we use. Um, and that gives us more accurate dose calculation. So again, it can calculate dose in the various tissues and take into account a whole bunch of different things. Um, the other thing that's really been a game changer for radiotherapy is inverse treatment planning. Um, and that's what we'll talk about uh, shortly. So what does it mean to treat uh, a patient well? So not just treating a patient, but treating a patient well. Um, so a good patient treatment um, will give the treatment volume, so our target volume, the required dose of radiation that our radiation oncologist has prescribed. Uh, and at the same time, it will minimize the amount of radiation dose that any healthy tissue uh, is exposed to. So there's really a couple of things we need to figure out in, do, in you know, determining how to do a good treatment uh, for our patients. So first, we need to define what the treatment volume is. Um, and then we need to define organs at risk. So in order to define the treatment volume, we do this by um, contouring our target structures. So normally contouring target structures is done by a radiation oncologist, um, but it's really important that as radiation therapists and treatment planners, you understand all the different components uh, that actually make up the various target structures because it goes beyond just, here's my tumour. Um, there are multiple kind of structures involved in calculating a treatment volume. So some of those uh, structures that you will include in a radiation therapy plan is the GTV or the gross tumour volume. So this is the tumour that you can see with your eyes. Uh, you know, if it's a large bulky tumour and possibly uh, sticking outside of the surface of the patient's skin, you can obviously see, uh, see where that tumour is. Uh, sometimes it's a tumour that you can easily see on a CT. Uh, sometimes you need to use an MRI or a PET uh, to be able to accurately see where the tumour is. Um, but that's what you can actually see as tumour. That's what we call the gross tumour volume. Um, another target volume that we use is called the clinical target volume. So this is where the radiation oncologist would expect that there was, there might be a clinical spread of the tumor. So obviously the gross tumor volume is really like kind of a mass, like it's, it's a large kind of mass of tumor cells, but there is most likely microscopic cancerous cells surrounding that tumor. Uh, so this is what our clinical target volume encompasses. So um, in some instances, the clinical target volume will just be a uniform expansion around our gross tumor volume. Um, and in, in some cases, depending on what's around our tumor, um, that clinical target volume may only spread in certain directions. Um, and may not have an expansion at all. But so the clinical target volume takes into account where we think there might be microscopic cancer cells that we still need to, to expose to radiation to kill them off also. Um, so the next target structure that we have in a treatment plan is called the planning target volume or the PTV. Um, and this is a geometrical expansion of the CTV. So the size of the expansion from the, from the CTV depends on a whole bunch of things. Um, but really what the planning target volume expand or the, the CTV expansion to create the planning target volume is really trying to take into account those uncertainties that you see in day-to-day -day treatment of your patient. So 
there's only so so much accuracy that you can set your patient up with. You know, you put them on the couch and you lay them down, you set them up with lasers and you might take a, you know, a KV image or, you know, an MV image or take a film, whatever it is you do. There's just that uncertainty about are they exactly where we've planned them to be? Um, so in order to take into account that uncertainty, that's why we put an extra margin around our clinical target volume to create the planning target volume. So the planning target volume takes into account any uncertainties that you might have um, in both positioning the patient and also the machine. The machine may have uncertainties. If, you know, if there's physicists out there, you know, you can tell, you know, we'll tell you like the ISIS center of a, of a machine is not a single point in space. It's usually a bit of an ellipse of, you know, one millimeter or so. So there's uncertainty and, you know, there's uncertainty in your know, collimator positions and all of that. So that's why we have to put um, an expansion on our clinical target volume to make sure that Claire, within all of that, we're still covering our volumes. Yes. We have a, a few questions in the chat that I thought were really great. Um, so Vishal has asked if the PTV can be decreased depending on the equipment an institution has. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. So the the PTV is dependent on how sure you are about your equipment accuracy and also your patient positioning accuracy. So, um, you know, if your equipment is super accurate and, you know, you, you're you doing lots of tests and you're confident that the couch rotation and the couch position and the gantry rotation and collimators and all of that is within a certain spec, then you can reduce your margin size. Absolutely. Um, so, and the size of the margin from the CTV to the PTV will depend on also the area of the patient that you're treating. And I do see someone's talked about the ITV. Um, just let me get to the next slide. We'll come to that one. Um, but so the, the margin between the CTV and the PTV can vary based on where in the patient the tumor is. Um, because there can be internal motion and it's sort of a bit of the ITV, um, but it, it can also be larger uncertainty in setting up a patient. So, for example, a lot of our margin sizes for a lot of our pelvis kind of treatments are about five millimeters for CTV to PTV. But when we treat a brain, um, obviously, the rest of the brain is, is we don't want to expose that to any radiation. So we want to keep our our margin size really, really small. Um, and because the head doesn't tend to swell or move or, you know, you can kind of position that a little with a little bit more certainty, we can reduce the margin size uh, for our cranial treatment. So it really depends on, yes, the accuracy of your equipment. So if you have really great equipment, you can reduce the, the margin size and also the accuracy of your setup. So, you know, if you have some really great patient immobilization systems, uh, you can reduce the margin size there as well. So, um, but there are other things that impact. So obviously you're contouring um, accuracy. So if you're registering, if you're using CT and MR to contour, you've got to link those two images together and that has uncertainty. And so there's a dozen, a dozen different areas and, and things that can bring uncertainty into that that all have to be taken into account uh, into the margin size so that's like a whole nother lecture that I could get into with you maybe I should at some point um, just give a lecture on margin sizes because it is quite interesting um, so and I, just let me see if I can go through some of the questions that are coming up as well sure. um, uh, there was one about the type of verification MV or KV uh, yes so, yeah, so you could have MV or KV, depending on what uh, equipment you have. So you could have a cone beam CT. Um, and I know, I think there's a presentation in a few weeks' time that talk about different imaging techniques in radiation therapy. Um, so you could have a cone beam CT um, on your LINAC. So that's your KV kind of image, or you could just have KV panels and take orthogonal images using a KV um, onboard imager. You could have use a, an EPID um, device attached to your LINAC and use MV imaging uh, for your patient uh, verification. So it really depends on 
what systems you have in place on your LINAC as to whether you'd use MV or KV um, as well. So, and I can also see just in the chat, some of you are talking about different margin sizes. Um, obviously, different departments will have worked out different margin sizes based on the equipment they have and the, the techniques and things. So the examples I give are from my department and different departments will have different values. Different radiation oncologists may have different values based on their own personal choices as well. So, um, so that's all uh, quite unique. So I know next week is a contouring lecture. Um, I'm pretty sure Ben is giving that, he's a radiation oncologist, so he might be able to give you a little bit more insight into the, the decision-making that goes on um, around choosing margin sizes as well. Um, so I will move on to the next slide. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I'm just going to give an example um, of the different volumes that I've just been talking about. Okay, so here we have you know, a beautiful MRI of a patient with a glioblastoma in their brain. Um, it's quite obvious where our GTV is. We can quite clearly see that this is the tumour inside this, this lovely patient of ours. So that's your GTV. Okay. Um, so now we have the CTV, which is our GTV plus the margin. Now remember that margin is based on um, microscopic tumour extent. Okay, so depending on the, the tumour and whatever else, that GTV plus margin, that margin could be multiple different sizes. Um, now, in this case, you can see that there's no margin along the skull of this patient, and that's because a glioblastoma tumour is restricted to soft tissue, so it's not going to infiltrate the bone. So there is no way that there is tumour inside the bone. So that's not part of our CTV. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then this next one, we've now added an extra margin. So we've now got our PTV. Um, so for the PTV, the margin is symmetric. So the expansion does go into the skull. And that's because the, the uncertainty is due to setup. And that setup could be in any direction. Um, or, you know, due to the machine capabilities or whatever, which can be in any direction. So we do extend that margin into the skull at that point because it could be a moment where the patient's been shifted, you know, to the left or the right and, and that tumour now lies within that area. So, um, so that's the sort of thing that we look at um, with those three different volumes. Um, now someone uh, in the chat mentioned an ITV. So we have some cancers where we know during treatment, so during their radiation exposure, when the beam is on treating that patient, that tumour is going to be moving. Um, so we need to add an additional contour in there um, to account for that internal motion. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is what we call the ITV. So this is the internal target volume. So it accounts for internal organ movement. Things like breathing, move up and down. Um, I did have a really good image of just, you just see a tumour in a lung and it's just moving as the patient breathes, up and down it goes. So you can't define a singular like GTV in this patient because the GTV moves all over the place uh, during treatment. So this is what the ITV uh, takes into account. Um, so it sort of takes into account the position of the GTV and the CTV and then expands on that to incorporate the motion of all of that uh, during um, the time the radiation beam is on. Okay, so you'll typically see an ITV used in lung and upper GI cancer cases. Um, so not so much anywhere else because the internal organ motion is less um, in those areas. So pelvis, brain, head and neck, there's not so much movement. It's really just around here where you've got your lungs and you've got your, um, you know, your, your abdomen and your diaphragm uh, moving things around during the course of treatment. Um, obviously, if you can get your patient to hold their breath during treatment, so things aren't moving, um, that can reduce that volume that you need to, to cover, but 
it would be very hard to ask a patient that is suffering badly from lung cancer to hold their breath. Um, so usually you can't, um, you know, incorporate those kind of treatment techniques in patients that have, that have lung cancer because they're already struggling to breathe as it is. Okay. Okay, so how much radiation do we need to give the target structure? Um, and I know um, Ben gave you a talk in session one, briefly covered this stuff, um, and I'll briefly cover it again, I guess. Um, but really what we need is our radiation oncologists need to write a clear prescription. Um, and so they need to define how much radiation they want the target volumes, so be that, GTV, the CTV, the PTV um, to receive. So traditionally, um, the prescription was point based. So you'd have your ICRU reference point, which would be somewhere within your target volume. Um, and they'd say, I want 50 gray to the ICRU reference point. Okay. When we start talking about IMRT and VMAT, SBRT type treatments, um, the prescription now starts to need to be referred to a volume, okay? And these volumes should be your GTV, your CTV, PTV, ITVs, um, and it should be very clear. So it should be a volumetric-based prescription. So, for example, the, the young radiation oncologist prescription may say, I want 95% of the prescription dose covering 95% of the target. Okay, um, and so obviously in an ideal world, you want 100% of the prescription goes covering 100% of the target. But in most cases, this is not a realistically achievable prescription. So, you know, the prescription needs to be of a high standard. You know, they want, they want to push the limits of what can be achieved, but it's, it's very difficult to achieve 100% of the prescription dose to 100% of the target and then limit dose to all the, all the, the healthy tissue around it. Um, so usually it's sort of, it sits around a, you know, 95%, 95 coverage or 98%, 95 coverage, those, those sort of criteria. Um, Claire, can you just mention what ICRU is, um, what it stands for? Oh, right. Yes. Sorry. So the ICIU is the International Commission on Radiological Units. Um, so if you Google that, they have a whole bunch of uh, reference documents. Um, so I, there's all these different reports with different numbers and it's really late at night and I can't remember <laughs> the specific numbers of the reports. Um, yes, International Commission on Radiology Units. So um, so they were sort of the first, I guess, organization that defined radiation dose in radiation therapy. Um, so they were the ones that sort of said, you know, your radiation dose should be no more than 100, 107% of your prescription and no less than 95% of your prescription to your, you know, to your tumor and all those kind of things. So if you look up the website, there is like hundreds of reports on various things. Um, so, and it, you know, there'll be one on IMRT, there'll be one on point dose calculations, there'll be one on brachytherapy, there'll be, you know, there's, there's just dozens of them. So, um, and they're all very interesting and, and, um, certainly have a chat with your radiation oncologist because they should be very aware of these documents and reports as well. Um, and they sort of should sort of form part of your, um, I guess your treatment treatment guidelines and protocols within your department. So, um, and so within this prescription, um, you know, how much radiation do we give the target structure? Um, those ICIU documents will form part of the decision-making process for the radiation oncologist as well. Um, so I, I just wanna note, um, you know, we talk about a prescription dose, and we're talking about dose to our target, but the prescription should also include uh, dose limits for any organs at risk um, or normal tissue. So, you know, the prescription is often quite an extensive document. It's not a single sentence. Um, you know, our prescription is sort of a 
it's an electronic prescription. It's it's like a whole page where they'll talk about the different um, target volumes and the different you know doses they'd like to give to the different target volumes, and then there'll be a list of organs at risk and the different dose limits um, that they want to give to all of those organs at risk. So the more information they can give you in the prescription, the better the plan uh, you guys as planners uh, can create for them. So that's really important. And that communication um, between yourselves and the radiation oncologist is really important. If you look at a prescription and you don't understand what it is that they're asking for or they're telling you to do, um, please have a conversation with them um, because it can be easily misinterpreted and you could be delivering, you know, the, the wrong dose to, to your patient. So there's, there's no harm in asking for clarification if you don't understand a prescription as well. Um, so how much radiation do we give the target structure? Like why do some patients have two gray fractions and some have 1.8 gray? Why do some patients get 40 to 50 gray dose and some get 70 to 80 gray dose? Um, and so that all comes down to radiobiology. Um, so the ultimate goal of radiotherapy is to find a treatment that gives the best probability of controlling our tumour, making our tumour disappear with the lowest probability of causing any kind of complications with the normal healthy tissue that surrounds it. So we've got tumour control and we've got normal tissue complication. So high tumour control, low normal tissue complications. So in general, um, normal tissue cells uh, require a higher dose of radiation for damage to occur to them. So not all, but mostly. Like normal tissue cells are better at recovering from radiation damage than a cancerous tissue cell is. Um, so rapidly dividing tissues, which are you know cancer cells, are really radiosensitive. So they require less radiation for the cell to die. So what we can see in this graph here is we've got this, the green line is our tumor control probability. So the more dose we give our tumor, the higher the probability that we're going to kill that tumor off. Okay. The black line you can see on this curve is our normal tissue complication. So if we give no dose, we've got 100% chance we're not going to cause any damage to our normal tissues. As we increase the dose, uh, radiation dose to our normal tissues, we start to, in to decrease uh, the chance of having no complications. So, you know, down here, we've basically got a 100% chance that we're going to have complications. So really what we're looking at um, is finding the best balance between getting really good tumour control and minimising the normal tissue complication. So this is what we call our therapeutic ratio. So it's sort of this, this value within this sort of yellow window here um, is really where we're determining the dose for our patient. And those curves look different depending on what tumour you're looking at. So for a prostate cancer, for example, those prostate cancer cells need more radiation to kill off the cancer cells. So they usually need to get more dose uh, in total um, than you know, then something else. Skin is a really radiosensitive um, cell. So if you've got skin cancer, you don't need as much radiation dose as you do for prostate. So every different tumour um, has different curves. And so this dose, this therapeutic ratio dose uh, will be different depending on the, the tumour itself. So, and, and that data, to form these curves comes from uh, historical data. So evidence from clinical trials, also evidence from atomic bomb survivors and things like that um, to determine the right balance between controlling the tumour um, and controlling or and reducing the risk of normal tissue complication probabilities. Um, so I've just seen someone ask a question about what could be the reason behind hyperfractionation for prostate cases. Um, so that's radiobiology as well. Um, so there's biological equivalent doses and a whole bunch of things like 
that's a whole, again, a whole nother lecture you could do on this. Um, hyperfractionation of the prostate is about reducing the number of fractions, well, reducing the number of fractions that a patient has to have. So it's, it's just reducing the overall treatment time. Um, so, which is convenient for the patient, convenient for the department, um, and produces the same uh, biological factors, spreading it out um, over multiple fractions. So, but again, it depends on how accurately you can deliver the dose. So if you don't have equipment um, or treatment techniques that can accurately deliver really high doses of radiation, uh, minimizing the dose around it, then you shouldn't be doing hyperfractionation. Um, because you have a very strong risk of damaging the normal tissue around it. So um, there's trade-offs and decisions that have to be made based on a whole bunch of different things. Um, there's no one size fits all uh, for either a patient or a department. Um, so it's, it's a lot of conversations and, and communication between physics and therapists and oncologists um, to figure out the, the best way that's going to work for your patients in your department. Okay, so we'll try and move back into like the, the guts of, of treatment planning, I guess. Um, so what do we need to consider in order to create a good uh, 3D plan? So some of the things that you need to think about. Um, obviously, beam angles are really important. So the more beams you add through your patient, obviously the more normal tissue that you are going to irradiate um, with radiation. However, um, whilst you're irradiating more tissue, that tissue will be irradiated to a lower dose because you're kind of sneering out that dose uh, around the patient. So it's actually a really nice way to increase dose to our tumour um, and keep dose to our normal tissues being low. Um, so you can see in this example on the right here, we've got four fields um, for a, a prostate patient. So you can see the heads of femur here are getting, you know, a reasonably high dose from our lateral beams. If we then change it to a seven field, um, you can see that the dose to our heads of femur are less, even though now parts of the body that weren't being exposed to radiation are now being exposed, um, that radiation level is low. Um, and so if we're going to use more beam angles, we need to make sure that we choose beam angles carefully to spare sensitive organs. Uh, so you try and create beam angles around uh, those sensitive organs. Um, more angles gives great opportunity for conforming dose around the target volume. There are some disadvantages uh, with adding more beams to your treatment. Uh, more beams will increase the overall time to treat the patient. patient. So if you were to treat four fields or seven fields, it's going to take you longer to treat seven fields than four. Um, and obviously, the longer it takes to treat the patient, the greater the chance the patient is going to move during treatment um, and also the less patients you can treat per day. Um, and I know for a lot of you, you've got crazy busy clinics. And so, you know, sometimes it's about treating as many patients as you can, um, maybe with fewer beams um, so that you can actually treat, treat more people in a day. So there, there are pros and cons. And again, um, decisions around that need to be part of a conversation that you have as a department. Um, so other things that we need to consider in creating a good 3D plan uh, is beam shape. So conformality. So the more we can shape the radiation beam to match our target, um, the better the radiation dose is going to be to that target. So we can use custom physical blocks um, although these are often really labor intensive and are generally single use only, um, or the you know the more the more common way to do uh, beam shaping these days is to use multi leaf collimators. Um, so the other thing we need to think about uh, when using things like multi leaf collimators is our collimator angle. 
So the collimator angle choice is also important when using MLCs in order to conform to a target shape. So you can see in this example here, collimator angle of zero, we're really not getting to spare that tissue in the middle of our kind of horseshoe shaped volume. Whereas if we rotated our collimator 90 degrees, we can actually get it way more conformal beam shape uh, for our target at that point. Um, so by improving the way we can shape our beam, we're increasing the conform conformality of our treatment. Um, so standard four field block, if we've got this sort of, you know, unusually shaped tumor, we use a standard four field box technique. We've got quite a bit of normal tissue that we're going to irradiate. Um, when we sort of move to a 3D conformal style treatment, we've got a lot less uh, normal tissue um, that we're irradiating. And then IMRT will be that we're, you know, really closely matching uh, the tumor volume as well. Okay, so what else can we do? to conform the radiation beam to the target. Um, and this is actually the crux to what IMRT and BMAT is. Um, so this is a really important slide um, that I hope makes sense to you. Um, so not only can we, can we adjust the shape of the beam and the outline of the beam to match the target, but we can also change the intensity of the beam to match the target. So a normal radiation beam has what's called a uniform fluence, right? So here's our beam here, and you can see it's an unusual shape. You know, it's, it's obviously highly conformed to our target shape, but the radiation beam itself, so the number of photons in that beam is uniform across the whole volume. So if we think about three beams passing through this patient, here's, here's our three beams. The beam profile is flat. It's just kind of a flat beam profile, uniform dose of radiation passing through the patient. What intensity modulation does, this is why it's called intensity modulation, is it has a variable fluence across the whole beam. Um, so it's better able to match the 3D structure, I guess, of the target and the surrounding organs at risk. So for example, you know, we've got the same field shape in these two examples here, but this one has a non-uniform fluence. You can see the bottom half of the field has more radiation being delivered to it than the top half of the same field. Um, so that's what we call intensity modulation. Um, and you can see in this example over on the right, the beam profile of each of these beams looks very different. Um, so in this case, we've got a beam coming um, a PA beam coming through. We've got the rectum sitting right in the middle of our um, volume. So we've got a low intensity in the middle of our beam to reduce the dose to the rectum. Um, so really the radiation beam is just hitting the two sides of the prostate in this case. Uh, come, when we've got a lateral beam coming in here, it's just a sharp peak um, of our radiation beam profile because that's the skinny part that we're trying to treat through here and spare the bladder and the, and the rectum between it. This beam that's passing through the bladder to get to the prostate, the thicker part of the bladder that it's passing through, we're going to have a lower intensity bit of radiation so that we're not exposing the bladder to as much dose as, as, um, as we need to. So this is really the crux of what intensity modulation is. It's about conforming the shape of your field size, but then also conforming the intensity of the radiation within that field shape um, to match, um, I guess, the, the, the different areas of intensity that you need to deliver um, to your tumor volume and spare the organs around it. So um, yeah, if you can just like remember this bit, this bit is kind of the whole thing. And when people first thought of this, and it wasn't that long ago, um, you know, 20 years ago, I guess, this, this came in. Um, the, the people that first went, what else can we do to make this better? Let's actually think about an individual beam and, you know, individual parts of it, make one bit stronger and one bit weaker. And, you know, that was, that was groundbreaking um, and has changed radiation therapy uh, forever. Um, 
So when we have conformal radiotherapy, um, so, you know, IMRT, VMAT kind of therapy, it allows a higher dose of the tumours while protecting the normal tissue. Um, so the goals of conformal or IMRT, VMAT radiotherapy is to deliver the full dose uh, using the most conformal coverage of the tumour or the target volume. We want to minimise the radiation toxicity to healthy tissue located close to the target volume. We also need to keep the treatment set up as reproducible and simple as possible. Um, so that's to keep our margins nice and small and to make sure because we're now super conformal, you know, we have these fancy, intensely modulated beams that are purely matched to our volumes. If we're not setting up our patient in the same way every day, we're probably missing parts of the target um, because we are so highly conformal. Um, and the other thing that's really important with this type of treatment is that we perform quality assurance uh, to comply with ICIU, uh, there it is again, um, recommendations and to sure, ensure that the radiation dose is delivered accurately. Um, so really we wanna make sure that the radiation dose we deliver is within 5% of what we're intending to deliver um, to the patient. So that's really important. So there's a lot more work for everybody uh, in the department to implement these type of treatments. Okay, so we quickly get and do a couple of Zoom polls. I'm not sure if you can see the pictures if I don't share, is that? Let me stop sharing. Oh, okay. Can everyone still see my screen? And can they see the Zoom poll question? I can see both, but <laughs> mine's a bit different. People are answering, so obviously you can. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so in this case, look at this question. So which of the following plans is the most conformal to the target? So we've got top left, which is this one up here, A. We've got uh, top right, which is this one here, B. We've got bottom, bottom left, which is this one here, C. And bottom right, which is this one, D. Okay. Okay. Right, lots of answers in the chat with C. <laughs> People are cheating. They can see everybody's answers. <laughs> Let that run for a minute or so. All right. Looks like B and C are kind of yeah fighting it out. Top contenders. <laughs> All right, it looks like most people are done answering. We have bottom left C as the 60% winner. Okay. And top right B in second place there. Certainly, and in the chat, I think C is the clear winner. Um, yes. So. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, well, let's see. So bottom left, so C is the correct answer in this case. So, um, you know, we can look at B. So it's very, it's a little bit hard to see, but you can see the outline here. Um, and you can see we've got quite a lot of high dose sitting outside of our target volume um, in, in B. Um, obviously, A and D, we're really kind of not covering our target volume here. We're actually got the high doses sitting outside of the target volume in this case. C, you can see that we've got beautiful coverage of our target volume with, with low doses uh, sitting around the outside of it. So um, C is the correct answer. Bravo to all of those who got that one right. Um, I'm now going to test you with another question. This one's harder, okay? Um, so this question, um, we just need to put the next poll question up, perfect. Um, so which of the following plans is most conformal on the target in this question? So we've got A, top left, this one, 
B is top right, this one here. C is bottom left, this one. And D is bottom right in this one. So which is most conformal to the target in this case? And you kind of have to get really close to the screen actually because, you know, first glance, they all kind of look the same. <laughs> Lots of people picking D in the chat, and it's the, the yeah. winner in the, in the poll questions there. All right. right, people feeling pretty confident now. They've done the easy <laughs> one, and then this is good. Unless we're right, we'll find out. All right. Well, it's looking again like we have a clear winner, especially in the chat. Everyone's choosing D and we've got almost 65% of people in the poll itself choosing D. All right. Well, let's let's have a look. OK, well done. So it is D in the bottom right. Now, this one is harder. OK, I think obviously A is not as conformal to the target as the other three. Um, so, you know, that's, that's fine. Um, B, you can see, you know, down here, we've got a little bit of dose coming outside our target volume, which is not great. Um, it's not super hot dose inside the target itself. Um, C, there's some coolness around the edges of the target, a little bit hot down here. Um, but D is really nice and evenly uniform and hot and not sort of spreading outside of our volume too much. Um, and we've got, you know, I guess uniform drop off around the volume also, uh, which is really, really good. Um, these ones have obviously got areas of, of higher dose spreading further away from our volume as well. So, um, yes. So for all of you who are very confident with your D, um, obviously you're learning stuff and that's good. You can you can critique a plan well. So that's great. Um, and that's and really important you, skill. How would you identify the hotspot in these plans? Would you just kind of use the ICRU values or is there something in particular you're looking for for hotspots and cold spots on those plans? Um, oh, I'd use, so this is um, ISO shades, which I really like. Isodose lines um, on a plan really confuse me. I don't know if it's just me, but I get, is this a volume or is this an isodose or, so I really like the iso shades like this. Um, and then I tend to play with the, the um, range of my iso shades um, to, to find out where my hot areas are and where my cooler areas are. Um, that, that tends to be the way that, that I do it. Um, and obviously your planning system will tend to point out your max dose point um, automatically anyway. And then you can look, look around uh, each individual slice as to where the max dose point is and, and have a look that way. But um, I tend to use the ISO shades in my um, range in my ISO shades uh, to my advantage. But Jill, I don't know if you, you, you have a different method. <laughs> No, I, I definitely like the dose wash view. Um, I find the the lines are, it, it kind of turns into a mess of spaghetti sometimes when you're looking at the, the isodose lines versus contours and trying to wrap mm -hmm. your mind around that. So definitely the, the dose wash is, is much more helpful. Yes. Yeah. No, I love it. I was so excited when I discovered how to do it. It was mind blown. It was excellent. Okay, we'll keep going. We've still got quite a few slides to get through. I'm sorry, people. Um, okay, let's talk about how we make a good plan. Um, so a good plan starts with simulation. Um, so we've, we've talked about margin sizes and how the, the margin size is determined by how reproducible our patient is set up and you know various bits and pieces. So at simulation, it's really important that we create that reproducible setup uh, at the time of simulation. So we need to think about things like 
are the patient's arms up or are the patient's arms down? Um, are we going to use respiratory gating? So are we thinking about getting them to breath hold or, you know, monitoring um, their respiration during treatment? Other bits and pieces like that. So, for example, there was a patient plan that I looked at on Friday. It was Friday afternoon and due to start on Monday. Um, and it was a it was a spine treatment. And so they were having, you know, a full arc of radiation, well, two full arcs of radiation around them. And they had their arms down in the CT scan. Um, and I looked and I went, well, we don't want to be treating through the arms if, if we can avoid it. So why have we got the arms in the CT scan? Um, and the therapist who'd created the plan hadn't um, put the arms in the body contour. So they weren't actually included in the plan, but they were there in the CT. So I had to sort of go in and talk to them. I went, you've got the arms in the CT, but it doesn't seem like you've put it in the plan. And how is this going to work? And they went, oh, well, when we scanned them, we thought this was going to be an APPA kind of treatment. We didn't think we were going to be doing a BMAP. Um, but then when they tried to plan it, it was really hard. So they decided to move to a VMAT. Um, so they said when they're going to treat them, they're going to have their arms up crossed over their chest so in that case um, their arms actually won't be in the path of the beam but um, that's the sort of stuff that you have to think about it's the time of simulation I guess um, and maybe that's something that even if you're not sure if you're going to do you know a four field box APPA kind of traditional treatment or an IMRT VMAT kind of treatment maybe prepare your patient as if you are going to do a more complex plan just so that if you do move down that path it's already set up for you um so the, i guess the other things you need to think about at simulation for your patient setup is is the patient comfortable if the patient is really uncomfortable there is no way they're going to lie still um, during treatment and there's no way you're going to be able to position them every day in the same position because they're not comfortable so we need to make sure we keep the patient as comfortable as possible um, the patient position on the table. So make sure they're centered on the table, not too far to one side or the other. Um, and also just make sure that you write anything unusual about the setup in the patient notes. So I don't know if there's, if there's something weird, if they've got to, you know, remove their false teeth or, you know, do something special, have one arm up, one arm down during treatment. Make sure all of that is noted uh, in the patient's um, record so that it can be reproduced uh, at the time of treatment as well so but there will be a whole nother uh, another presentation on simulation so i won't i won't cover too much of that any more of that now um, okay so how do we plan an imrt vmat plan it's the big questions why you're all here today right um, so it is virtually impossible to manually plan a good IMRT VMAT plan um, yeah. because we're talking about not just talking about you know drawing the outline of shapes and putting you know seven beams with a nicely outlined beam outline on it because we're talking about intensity modulation remember so we're talking about different fluences for each of those seven beams as well so your fancy outline as well as all the changes within the individual beam itself so there is no way you could manually determine what that each individual beam should look like. Um, it's just too complicated to manually do it. So this is where the term inverse planning starts to come in. So what I call manual planning, I guess, is what we call forward planning. Okay, so this is where the planner creates the plan to fulfill the prescription. This is forward planning. Um, the alternative is we tell the planning system what the prescription is and then the planning system creates the plan for us. Okay, so that's inverse planning. So forward planning is when we create the plan to fulfill the prescription. Inverse planning is we tell the system what the prescription is and it creates the plan for us. So that's inverse planning. So it's just doing it in the reverse um, of what we would traditionally do. Uh, for a manual plan so that's that's why it's called inverse planning because it's kind of the reverse of what you would normally do so really the differences between forward planning so forward planning is a manually defined treatment plan um, 
where you get a prescription dose, um, you get your target and organ at risk contours, uh, you define the beam directions, you define the beam shapes, you define the beam weights. And then in order to improve the plan, you as the planner adjust the beam shapes, the angles, the weights um, to improve the plan quality. In inverse planning, uh, we manually define the prescription dose, the contours, and then what we call dose objectives for our target and our organs at risk, which really is also part of the prescription. Um, and sometimes we'll define what the beam, what beam directions should be used as well. And then the computer determines for, determines for us what the field shapes are and what the beam weights are. So in inverse planning, in order for a planner to improve the plan quality, you, abdu you adjust the dose objectives and the contours in order to improve the plan. So, um, so they're sort of the differences. So I think um, this slide is quite helpful uh, for you guys that are trying to get your hand around what the differences are. Um, so we'll sort of dig down a little bit deeper into the principles of inverse uh, treatment planning now, just in this last section. Um, so contouring. Um, so we talked a little bit about contouring targets. Um, so, but accurate contouring of targets and also your organs at risk is absolutely critical in inverse planning because these are the volumes that are used by the planning system to generate the treatment plan. Okay, so in terms of target and tumour contours, so our PTV, CTV, GTV, and ITV, if, if it's there, must be perfect, must be as perfect as possible. So contoured by radiation oncologists. <clears throat> um, if, the con if those contours aren't perfect, you're not going to get a perfect plan, basically. For our organs at risk contours, now there are a lot of organs at risk contours, particularly you know, the head and neck and, you know, those kind of structures. So we want our contours to be perfect, as perfect as we can get them for structures that are really close to our target volumes. Okay, because this is where the hottest of the dose is going to be. So those organ at risk contours need to be perfect. The targets that are for organs at risk that are a bit further away from our target structures, these contours can be a little bit imperfect. Obviously, we want everything to be as perfect as possible, but time is usually a big factor. Okay, um, so if you've got organs at risk that are sitting well away from your target, you can contour them a little bit quicker, uh, a little bit rougher uh, if you need to. Um, and then there are going to be other contours that you add that are used just to help generate a good plan. So they might not even be, an, they're not organs at risk, they're not targets, they're just planning contours, basically. Um, so the, the thing about, oh, Ben's here. Hi, Ben. Um, <laughs> And Ben's going to be talking about contouring next week. Um, so the important thing to know about contouring and inverse planning is if you haven't specified a tissue in your biocontour, then the treatment planning system is not going to try and minimise dose to that area. Okay, so dose to that area or that tissue is going to be unpredictable. Um, so the idea is you contour everything. That you possibly can um, so you can tell the treatment planning system no don't want dose there no don't want dose there don't want dose there don't do want dose there but not there not there um, if you don't put all those things in the planning system will go okay well you want 50 gray here you don't care what goes what dose goes over here so we'll give that 40 gray and you haven't told us about this we'll give that 30 gray when actually you want zero uh, in those areas but you haven't told us that as well so um, so contouring is like super important. Um, so what, structure, what structures do you contour and why? Um, so I've already talked about organs at risk that are close to the PTV. So it's sort of within two to five centimetres. They must be contoured, okay? You are going to have radiation passing through those, those organs at risk. They are going to be getting some dose. So it's really important that they're contoured and put into your uh, treatment planning system. Um, so some organs at risk only need to have a portion contoured. Um, 
because they're serial organs that have a maximum dose limit. Um, and we know that the maximum dose is always going to be close to the PTV for obvious reasons, because this is where you want your maximum dose to be. Um, and then we have parallel organs. Um, and they require the full structure to be contoured because it's a volumetric based dose limit um, rather than a max dose limit. Um, this stuff will kind of be covered uh, in more detail by Ben uh, next week. But <laughs> I'll also keep covering it here a little bit. Um, so I'm going to talk about serial and organic risk structures. So a serial structure will lose function or be damaged if any part of it exceeds a tolerance dose. So for example, your spinal cord is a serial organ. Um, so it has a 45 gray maximum dose. So if any part of the spinal cord receives more than 45 gray, the whole spinal cord will be damaged. Okay. Same as, you know, if you're in a car accident, you damage your spinal cord. Everything from that point onwards is damaged. Um, Parallel structures lose function only if too much of it exceeds a tolerance. So for example, lungs, um, if you ha have more than 20 gray to less than 30% of the volume, <laughs> that's right, it's too late, um, you'll start to get um, damage to the lungs. So um, there's a in the, there's an appendix at the back of all these slides, which I absolutely will not get time to go through it today, um, but you will receive them as part of the slides. And it talks about a lot of the different um, dose res restrictions to organs at risk. There's several slides that um, have some references about that. So I'm not going to um, cover too much of those. So, but some things to note, I guess, um, sometimes, uh, target coverage has to be compromised to make sure that the organ at risk tolerances aren't exceeded. So you do not want to damage the spinal cord. So sometimes you have to minimise dose to part of your PTV in order to spare the spinal cord, uh, for example. In other cases, the organ at risk cannot be spared in order to treat the disease. So if you are not going to cure a patient um, because you're missing part of the PTV, um, and maybe hitting part of the bowel. Sometimes you have to go, I'm going to have to accept that the bowel is going to be compromised because I need to treat the cancer. We need to treat the cancer. Um, so, and this is a really difficult decision that radiation oncologists have to make um, when looking at plans and writing prescriptions as to what the compromises are. And there's always compromises uh, in every plan. So in some cases like this, um, radiation oncologists will prioritise covering the GTV uh, instead of covering the PTV. So as long as the GTV, um, our gross tumour volume, is getting 100% of the dose, they're happy for some of the PTV. Um, so organs at risk is a normal tissue that's at risk of being damaged by high dose due to its proximity to the tumour. So here's just some examples of organs at risk contours that you will have to draw in um, for, you know, your treatment. Obviously, you don't have to contour in the lens and the eyes if you're treating a pelvis. Uh, and I would hope that you wouldn't have a CT that went from the top of the head uh, to a pelvis if you were treating a prostate patient. Um, but, you know, if you're treating a head and neck, then there is a whole bunch of things uh, that need to be contoured. And it takes a long time uh, to do. So planning uh, an inverse treatment plan takes a lot longer um, than your standard forward plan because of the contouring that you have to do. Um, there's a thing called a PRV, so a planning risk volume. Um, and this is an expansion of an organ at risk, a little bit like a PTV, so a CTV to PTV expansion. Um, we can have a PRV, so an expansion of an organ at risk, um, if there is a concern about variability in organ position. So this could be if you've got, you know, you've got bowel movement um, and motion and things like that. This um, also PRVs can be um, added to things like optic nerves that are highly sensitive, um, and you absolutely want to make sure that you do spare them. So you add a volume, a margin, a PRV. 
uh, around those organs at risk as well, just when they're, they're highly sensitive um, organs that you absolutely want to spare. So there are a couple of other terms there for you to remember. Um, so what does a radiation oncologist do if the PTV overlaps with a sensitive organ at risk? Um, so we can see here we've got spinal cord, um, we've got our GTV in yellow with a, a PTV around it. Um, so this is a spine treatment where the PTV is prescribed to 27 gray uh, in three fractions. Um, so it's, it's quite a um, high dose per fraction treatment. Um, and in that case, the spinal cord dose D max must be less than 20 gray um, because it is a high dose per fraction. So we've done the radiobiological calculations to determine that uh, for this dose per fraction, the spinal cord cannot receive more than 20 gray. Um, but we want to give our PTV 27, um, but our spinal cord's inside our PTV. So what do we do at this point? Um, so in this point, Point we would probably we would create a contour that's called PTV overlap uh, with cord. Um, so in this case, this part of the PTV uh, was allowed to receive a lower dose than the rest of the PTV in order to comply with the spinal cord dose limit um, because the um, the spinal cord was really important to be spared uh, in this case. So. That's the sort of thing um, that you need to think about in inverse planning. So you need to define this, this tiny small volume here that would go into your planning system to go, I know you've, we've said this is PTV, but we can't give it more than, than this amount of dose. Um, so, you know, those are those sort of extra structures that I was talking about before that aren't true organs, or um, but they're actually just there to help with the treatment plan. Um, so how do we use these contours in inverse planning? So for our PTV, CTV, GTV, ITV, so for our tumor volumes, target volumes, um, we want to put maximum and minimum dose criteria. Um, and these are as per the prescription. Um, and for our organs at risk, we want to have maximum dose criteria. Um, so this could be a point dose, a whole organ dose, a percentage of the organ volume. Um, and then sometimes you also want to specify a mean dose uh, to an organ at risk as well. Um, so the criteria are translated into constraints in the PTV and organ at risk. Um, and you put those into the treatment planning system and ask the planning system to create a plan that achieves uh, these particular aims. Uh, so the treatment planning system has what's called an optimization algorithm. So remember, an algorithm is a really fancy um, equation. So the planning system has an opt optimization algorithm. Um, and as clever as an optimization algorithm is, it's not super intuitive. It cannot read your mind. So the planner must tell the planning system every small detail that needs to be considered when the optimization algorithm is working to create the plan for you. Okay, so poor contouring could cause the PTV to overlap with an organ at risk, um, like we saw in the previous example, um, and the overlap will have opposing dose constraints. So if you haven't taken that into account, so if we hadn't put that small volume in and we've said, I want my PTV, PTV to get 27 gray, but I want my spinal cord to get less than 20, we've got two volumes that have opposing constraints because we can't get to 27 and stay under 20 at the same time. Um, so that will cause a problem uh, with the algorithm. So, and again, like I said before, if a volume doesn't have a dose objective or constraint, um, the optimizer can assign that area to receive whatever dose it likes. So if it needs to receive a high dose, it will receive a high dose. So sometimes if you've got organs at risk all around one side, um, it will just try and pump dose in from the other side because it's trying to reduce dose over here. Um, so if you haven't specified, no, I don't want a lot of dose coming in from this side either, um, then what's going to happen is you're going to get a whole lot of dose passing through an through that area. So um, 
So, you know, the, the optimization algorithm is not going to read your mind. Uh, it's only going to use the information that you've provided it at the time. Um, some constraints are more important than others. And so this is why we have a weighting or priority factor. Um, and this is applied to indicate to the planning system the level of need of achieving a constraint is uh, in a treatment plan. So for constraints that must be achieved, um, you're effectively having an infinite weighting or it's given the highest priority. So if you must give your whole PTV 27 gray, it's going to have a hundred percent priority. It's going to have a huge weighting. If you kind of, you want your bladder to get less than 50 gray, but it's okay if it gets a little bit more, you might give your bladder a 50% weighting um, so that the, the planning system knows, okay, well, this is what you want, but if I need to give it a little bit more to achieve the other things that are more important, then, then it can do so. Um, so weighting uh, is a really important thing um, in creating your, a good treatment plan. Um, when we're talking about those constraints and the dose constraints, we've got upper and lower dose constraints. So an upper dose constraint is a dose that you don't want to exceed. So for, an, for example, 5% of the volume shouldn't exceed a dose of 15 gray. So that would be you know, your organ at risk. You don't want more than 5% of your lens of your eye to get 15 gray, whatever it is. That's not a great example, but anyway. Um, lower dose constraints set the minimum dose that you want the volume to receive. Okay, so for example, you want 100% of the volume to receive at least 60 gray. So your target volumes will have an upper and a lower dose constraint. Okay, so obviously you want a minimum dose to your target, but you also want to set a maximum dose to your target. You don't want your target getting 400% isodose. Um, so you will set an upper and a lower dose constraint on your targets. Um, your organs at risk will only have upper dose constraints. You should never have an organ at risk that has a lower dose constraint. If you do, you're doing something wrong. So organs at risk will only have upper dose constraints. Um, so you're setting a maximum dose that you want your organ at risk to receive. Um, you don't put a lower dose constraint in because the minimum dose you want for your organ at risk is always zero. Like ideally, you want all your organs at risk uh, to get zero. So you don't set a lower dose constraint because you're just going to be setting it to be zero. Um, although some systems like that, it really depends on your planning system. Um, so I probably shouldn't say that. <laughs> but usually you only have upper dose constraints for your organs at risk. If you have a lower dose constraint for your organ at risk, it should be set at zero. Okay. So inverse planning is giving a list of treatment goals to the treatment planning computer. And then you, the computer makes an optimum plan based on the information that you have given it. Um, so, you know, it's giving the treatment goals and the contours, the treatment planning system, it then works away, it goes, here you go, here's your good plan. Okay, that's what inverse planning is. So like I've said before, inverse planning begins with contouring. So you contour your targets and your nearby organs at risk. You absolutely need all of those structures for the inverse planning. So for example, here's our target in the brain. Um, we've got brainstem, brain, left and right eyes. We've got the spinal cord, cochlea and optic nerves all contoured also uh, in this area. And there are a bunch of others you could also put in there uh, in the inverse plan. Um, you then set dose constraints and priorities for each of those contours. Okay, so here we've got um, the prescription for our PTV, 54 gray and 30 fractions. Okay, um, we've got some dose constraints for our spinal cord. So we want um, a maximum dose to 0 0.3, 0 0.03 cc of the spinal cord to be less than 50 gray. Um, and for the brainstem, we've got several dose constraints. So we really want the maximum dose. So 0 0.03 cc is really a really small volume um, that kind of corresponds to a maximum dose. Um, 
being less than 56 gray, um, we're quite happy to get a dose left less than 59 gray to a larger volume. So a point dose of 56, but a larger dose can get a, a slightly a larger volume can accommodate a slightly larger dose. Um, so, and these are all given equal priorities. These are all equally important um, for things that you see. So then we've got goals for our target, so PCV1. So we want 95% um, of our PTV to be receiving 100% of the prescription dose. Um, so and different planning systems will look different in the way that you import these things. Um, that's, it's all sort of the same process. Um, you then choose the number and position of the beams or arcs. Um, this could be automatic or manual, depending on the planning system and technique that you're using. Um, and then the beam energy is chosen by the planner. Um, so usually there's a guide for which energies you would use depending on the part of the patient that's being treated. Um, so you'd use a higher energy for tumours that are treated deeper inside the patient, mostly pelvic type treatments. You might use a higher energy beam if you have the option. Um, if you don't, then that's no problem. You just use the beam energy that you have. Um, so finally, the inverse plan optimization is done. So the beam fluence. So remember, if you remember back, we had that screen that we had, you know, fancy field shape, but uniform fluence. And then we had the fancy field shape with the, the modulated fluence, intensity modulated fluence. Um, so the planning system will create the beam fluence uh, for each beam or beam, each field or beam position. Um, and it will be optimized based on the prescription dose and the organs at risk constraints that you've put into the system. So, and in this case, the targets should receive the prescription dose. The organs at risk should be protected. Um, and, and usually there'll have to be compromises made if not all the goals can be met. Um, so for example, so this is a really busy kind of screen, um, but as the optimizer is working uh, in the planning system, you'll see um, your dose volume histogram here. Um, and this is given, um, I guess it's a, a visual of all the clinical constraints that you've given the system um, in, a, in a, I guess, a, a graphical form. Um, and so it will also show you down here uh, the steps the computer is using to try and satisfy the objectives or these curves will move to try and match uh, to where they need to be. So it's a bit of a visual um, picture of what the optimizer is doing and how it's working in the background to, to create this final uh, optimized plan for you. Um, what constraint settings you use for each different plan, um, be it tumor type, area that you're treating, um, prescription base. Um, so the constraint settings you use and the order that you use them um, really is a learned skill in treatment planning. So the more time you have to spend playing on the system and testing, you know, if I put a priority here of 80 instead of 100, what happens? Um, the, the better you will become at planning. Um, you know, it's very easy just to, to follow a prescription and go, well, I do this, 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 and this. Um, but it's, it's us as scientists and health professionals, I guess it's a little bit in our nature to ask the questions and the whys. And um, so if you have time to sit and change things um, in your, you know, your objective table there, your constraint table, to see what it does to the plan, um, the better planner you will become because you will understand how the system works a little bit better as well. Uh, let me see. I'm almost through, sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm going very late. Um, so I talked about dose volume histogram. So this describes the final plan. Reading a dose volume histogram can be really challenging. I still struggle with it, um, particularly if you have a lot of volumes. 
uh, on your dose volume histogram. Um, so if you struggle to read all of the lines, um, you can turn some off um, and do it one by one if, if you have to, if that makes more sense to you. So often I have to do that, it gets too confusing. Um, so a dose volume histogram is a graph that really relates the dose received by each structure as a volume. Um, and so each line on here represents a different structure. Um, so for example, this orange line here is your spinal cord. Um, and you can see that, you know, 100% of the, the volume is getting a, you know, a maximum dose of, or a minimum dose of, I don't know what that would be, 25. Um, and you can see that the maximum dose to the spinal cord is seven gray. Um, so reading these um, graphs is a little bit of an art. Um, so, so this axis here is the amount um, of volume of the structure. And then this axis is the dose that the structure receives. So your target volume should always be sitting at this end um, of the graph because they should be getting the most dose and hundred close to 100% of the volume getting the most dose. Um, and ideally you want your organ that risk to be sitting down this end um, of the graph because they should be getting the least amount of dose as well. But reading these can be um, a real challenge. Um, so um, I would advise you to spend a little bit of time um, reading these as well. Um, so just in summary, I'm, I'm nearly done, I promise, I promise. Um, so uh, inverse plane summary. So appropriate contouring is vital. Um, I think I've kind of been pretty clear on that. Clear clinical specifications are essential. So clear uh, prescription criteria, organ at risk criteria are essential. Um, know and understand your planning system's algorithm, right? So play on the planning system. Know what it does when you change different criteria. Um, ideally develop a class solution for consistency so that all the planners are working off the same uh, solution. They're starting with the same basis. Um, and the last thing is really important, always check the deliverability of the plan. So your planning system could come up with an amazing, uh, great plan, looks beautiful, the doses are all great, but the machine cannot physically deliver it uh, for because it cannot move the MLCs in quick enough time or the dose rate can't be changed. So, um, yeah, it, it's always important that you check you can actually physically deliver the treatment plan on the machine. So do a fraction zero um, kind of deliverability, if, if nothing else, um, just to make sure that you can safely deliver it um, to the patient on the treatment days. So um, just quickly, what else makes inverse plan IMRT treatments different to your standard conformal, um, you know, standard treatments? Um, it's more difficult to spot planning errors. Um, because these plans are so complicated and are so complex and you've had less input into how the plan is created, um, it's more difficult to spot errors in planning. And those errors are sometimes really slight, like it might be a tiny MLC leaf that's not doing what it should do. But how do you know that? How do you see it? You know, it's really difficult. Um, in, turn, in terms of delivering, it's more difficult to do in-field imaging because often your MLCs are all small little shapes to create this, this fluence. Um, doing an in-field image just doesn't work um, with an IMRT or VMAT treatment. So you often have to do a separate imaging uh, field uh, when you're setting up your patient. Um, depending on the treatment you're doing, sometimes the number of monitor units is a lot more um, than you're used to. And if you recall from the start of this lecture, all those hours ago, um, so it's important to understand how many monitor units you're expecting um, from a treatment. So sometimes you look at an IMRT plan and the number of monitor units are way more than you're used to with your standard type of treatment. So it's good to get a feel you have to kind of get a refill about what is an acceptable number of monitor units and what isn't. Um, 
So it's it's that makes it difficult and and more difficult to uh, spot problems as well. Um, organ motion has an unpredictable effect because you are so conformal because you have this intensity modulation going on. If you've got organs moving in and out of your field and things going on, uh, that has a really unpredictable effect both on the dose to the organ and the dose to your tumour uh, as well. So um, I've already mentioned deliverability on the LINAC can be questionable. If you have a plan that's really, really modulated, um, sometimes the MLC leaves can't move fast enough to deliver the beam um, that you need to do or the gantry can't rotate fast enough or the dose rate can't change quick enough. So sometimes you actually just can't deliver the plan that you want on the machine. Um, so for all of these reasons, um, a strong quality assurance program is really, is really vital. Um, so both in terms of checking the plan on the planning system um, and also checking the deliverability of the plan on the machine and also just checking the machine um, performance in general as well. Um, so just to kind of round things up, quality is paramount to achieving success. So all the enhancements in imaging, treatment planning, software and Linux are useless if you haven't identified the tumour correctly. So you're treating the wrong part of the patient or not, not treating the tumour. Uh, if the, the, the dosimetric parameters entered in the planning software aren't correct, so if the planning system isn't calculating your radiation beam correctly, um, every single patient you treat uh, is going to be treated incorrectly. Um, and also if you are not positioning your patient uh, correctly for each single treatment, um, you can have the fanciest plan in the world, but if you're not setting up your patient to match that fancy plan, um, yeah, kind of kind of pointless so that's really important those things are really important um so just a couple of final zoom polls if you can bear with me for a couple more minutes um so we're going to see how good you are at, at um reviewing a dvh um so according to this dvh hopefully you can see it clearly enough um, on your screens how much of the spinal cord so what fraction of the spinal cord is receiving a dose of 500 centigrade. Okay, so just for those who might not have a great screen, the spinal cord is this orange line here. So how much of the spinal cord is receiving a dose of 500 centigrade? Wow, it's a pretty clear winner. <laughs> yeah, we've got a lot in the chat for C, and the poll is looking like C is the clear winner oh, as well. Because you know, like when you have multiple choice, if you don't know the answer, you're supposed to pick C. Isn't that what you do? <laughs> Everyone's just guessing C. Excellent. Well, it looks like we have a clear winner there. So all right, and bravo to all of you. Yes, so C is the correct answer. Um, just to show you quickly. So I already pointed out that, that was the spinal cord uh, line just there. Here's our 500 centigrade. So we go up the 500 centigrade line. So we hit the, the spinal cord line and we come across and we're sitting at around about 34% there. So it looks like all of you um, could see that okay and interpret that DVH very nicely. So bravo. Um, one more DVH analysis for you. Um, so according to this DVH, 95% of the PTV is covered by what dose? So just pointing out the PTV line is this red line here. Right. Everyone aren't guessing because they're not choosing C this time. That looks like uh, D is coming out ahead. 
All right. Lots of answers for D in the chat as well. Okay. We'll let that one run for a few more seconds. Oh, I'm sorry. I've already given the answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Sorry. I'm just really conscious of time and how long I've taken. Sure. Really yep. Sorry, everyone. Um, yes. So all those who answered D, absolutely correct. Um, so here is our PTV line here. Um, we go to our 95% line um, in terms of the volume. We come across to our PTV and we go down and we're getting 25 gray uh, to 95% of the PTV, which this seems like a nice, nice dose. I would say that's a pretty good plan, getting good coverage. Okay. Um, so the take-home points from this awfully long lecture, which I apologize for. Um, so distance, field size, separation, target depth, all affect the number of monitor units needed to achieve to deliver a certain dose. Um, and this goes for IMRT and for regular, um, regular treatment plans as well. Um, beam energy, beam angles, conformality, and reliable patient positioning are all important for high quality 3D radiotherapy. Um, the GTV, CTV, and PTV are all terms used to describe target volumes. Um, ultimately, we, we usually focus on the PTV um, as, you know, that's what we're trying to get dose coverage to. Um, great contours, dose objectives and constraints, um, and appropriate priorities for each of these are crucial for creating a good treatment plan, um, which gives great um, treatment of disease and gives us higher doses to the target volumes by using inverse treatment planning. Um, and then the dose volume histogram uh, in a patient's plan gives us the information about how much uh, each contoured structure will receive. So are the targets being adequately covered by the dose? Are the organs at risk being protected? So we need to look at our DVH against our dose criteria um, to make sure that the plan that has been created matches uh, the prescription and the criteria that we're looking for. Um, so next week, we've got uh, the amazing Ben, who's going to be talking more about contouring. Um, I know there's been a, a bunch of questions in the chat, and I am happy to stay on and go back, wade back through them all um, and answer them. So that's no problem for those that are prepared to, to bear with me and stay on the line. I'm happy to stay on as long as needed. Um, so, but... Yeah, so there's some awesome um, lectures to come from 